<clears throat> All righty then. Okay, can you guys let me know if you can hear me? Okay, can you hear me? All right, friends. How you doing? How you doing? I got another Bruce Lee shirt. Okay. Okay, Christian Apologetics. JQ is announced. That's right. G to quality. Can you guys hear me? Okay, good. Glory to Jesus Christ. I don't know why it keeps giving me this notice because I'm looking at the comment section. Let me see. Can you see me? Let me see. Hold on a second. How you doing, Enzo? How are you? How are you? Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. Let me just see something. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why. I'm looking at the comment section. And when someone comments, it says show or hide. I don't know why it tells me that because most of you guys are kosher. Okay, I'm just waiting for the rest of the crew to show up by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Hey, Revelation 22, 13, I'm just waiting for a few more faces. Because I know that Hatun is debating ultimate deception on the crucifixion. Colossal waste of time, if you ask me. All right. By the way, I got another Bruce Lee shirt real quickly. Let's see. Can you see it? Let's see if you can see it. Let's see. Hold on. Jun Fan Gong Fu. There you go, Bruce Lee, right? Pray by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm starting to slim down. Pray I lose that 50 pounds, keep it off, get my health back. And God save me from vanity and pride in Jesus' name. Right? Okay. Someone was trying to educate me about Bruce Lee and his Wing Chun senior, Wong Shun Leung. Right. Guys, before I came to the faith, or I should say, yeah, I came to the faith when I was young, but I fell away. I used to be a huge Bruce Lee fan. Now I'm simply huge. And I studied that man's life inside and out, and he became an idol. But glory to Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus in his mercy saved me from that. May the Lord Jesus keep me pure from all idolatry in Jesus' name. Yeah, now someone is trying to teach me about Bruce Lee's history. And that some, somehow that Bruce Lee thought that Wong Shun Lung, Lung, even at the end of Bruce Lee's life, was the best fighter no that's not true but that's okay i'm not here to debate bruce lee he's irrelevant right yeah it's a waste of time by the way revelation 22 13 everyone else that was wa uh, watching listening last night what'd you guys think of the content yesterday our exposition exposition please holy spirit take over my mouth my tongue for the glory of jesus christ of john 17 john 10 and other related issues what do you think you guys enjoy? I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ, the Lord, being worshipped as God. We're just going to wait a few more minutes. But in the meantime, Bruce Lee is cool. I like the ground game better, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, remember, hey, Alan Ruhl, 1611, Bruce was around. He had a master the ground game because he did take judo from Jean LaBelle, who's considered the toughest man alive at that time. Yeah, and guys, keep praying for me that the Lord Jesus gives me the holiness to make me righteous and pure and holy, <clears throat> to delight his heart, to be completely in love with Jesus Christ. Right? Yeah, by the way, Zone Fighter, Burt Ward wasn't Bruce Lee's roommate. I know the story very well. Bruce Lee and Burt, Burt Ward met each other on the set of Batman because the producer of Batman, William Dozier, was the same producer that discovered, or I should say was told about Bruce Lee and gave Bruce Lee the part of Cato. But it's okay, Zone Fighter. I'll forgive you for your errors because it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong about Bruce Lee. You got to be right about Jesus Christ, our Lord. But let's put Bruce aside. Okay. Thank you, Adi Mech. Thank you for that prayer. That's right. Yep, student of Wing Chun. Yep, man. You have Yip Chun. Waiting a few more minutes, right? A few more minutes. And then we'll begin. And again, I want you to, guys to pray for first last. Pray the Lord Jesus will preserve this brother, give him victory over his struggles, perfect health, provide for his needs, and pray for his mother. 
and thank him because he's helping me to help you by posting verses, making it very easy for me in Jesus' name to do these sessions. So God bless him and thank everyone else who's an admin. Now, admins, just help me. If you see a troll, block him. If you see some Muslim trolls here or any other troll, blasphemous trolls, just block them because I want serious people here who really want to learn, even if they're not Christians. Look, you don't have to be a Christian to come to my channel. As long as you are serious to hear why we believe what we believe and receive answers that you're asking sincerely. Whether you become a follower of Jesus Christ or not, that's between you and Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? Yeah. Well, Allah doesn't exist. Yeah, I have seen him. Okay, folks. Get ready, get set. And by the way, is the debate over? Did they finish debating on the other channel, DCCI? Huh? God bless you, Robbie Stones. God bless every one of you. Good to see Chris Claus. Chris Claus is also a fellow apologist, a brother in Jesus Christ who loves Jesus. In his first public debate, he debated Shabir Ali. He's formidable. So pray that God will bless Chris Claus, his family, and preserve them for the glory of Jesus. We need more soldiers, not less. So anyway, <clears throat> no, I didn't say you were a Karm. You're not. You're not a troll. We know that. But we had trolls yesterday. How you doing, Captain Ron? God bless you, brother. I praise the Lord Jesus Christ that Satan didn't come between us, right, and that you're back to learn. And may God use me to bless you and help you to grow in your faith by the power of the Holy Spirit because I love all of you and love you for the sake of Christ. And I want to be used of the Lord to bless you, not to cause you to stumble. May Jesus save me from my own imperfections. Thank you, Tachmonite. Uh, everything good, everything great comes from God, comes from his grace and mercy. So praise the chime God, praise the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit for these blessings that he gives us. I don't want to take credit for it. All right. All righty then. So did, did anyone tell me, did that debate finish yet? So we'll begin. Did they finish the debate? So should we start? Let me know before we begin. Remember, there's a six six to seven second lag delay between when I say something and by the time it reaches you. Oh, I didn't finish the debate? Okay. All right. That's fine. Okay, then. I'm going to have to begin anyway, then. I don't want to wait for that. You know, so if you guys are ready, just put a one. We're going to begin in prayer because we need the Holy Spirit to fill every one of us and fill me, fill my heart, fill my soul, fill my mind, fill my mouth for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay, put a one if you're ready. Yeah, all righty then. Okay, <clears throat> let's just, let's come together in agreement and just praise, bless, magnify, glorify the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We love the Lord Jesus, your Son. We love your Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we bless you. We praise you. We cannot love you enough. We cannot love Jesus enough. We cannot love your Holy Spirit enough. So give us the power, the strength from your Holy Spirit to love you as you deserve to be loved for who you are, Father. To love Jesus for who he is and to love your Holy Spirit for he, who he is, Father. Not simply for what you've done for us, Father. You are worthy to be loved because of who you are. Your son is worthy to be loved because of who he is. Your spirit is worthy to be loved because of who he is. You are God and you alone. And you are ultimate reality. You are beauty itself. Everything perfect and beautiful and wise and, and magnificent and radiant and pure and righteous stems from you because you are purity and righteousness and beauty. You are love and you are wisdom and knowledge and life. Everything that is good because you are goodness itself, Father. We love you, Father. Father, I ask that as you bless the previous sessions, bless this session, fill me with the Holy Spirit of life and fill everyone present with the Holy Spirit of life. Cover us by the blood of Jesus, Father. Wash us and purify us of our flesh and our sin by the blood of Jesus and forgive us, Father. Cover our loved ones, in my case, my precious angels. Cover them with the blood of Jesus. Cover even their mother with the blood of Jesus and save her for your glory, Father. And Father, fill my lungs and my chest and my throat, my body with, with life and health from your Holy Spirit. Loosen my tongue to speak truth without error. 
Grant me clarity of thought and speech and perfect recall of the scriptures and bless everyone here to understand, Father. Open their eyes, their ears, their hearts, their minds to understand what your spirit would have us understand and give us the power to affirm the truths of scripture and to live them out for the glory of Jesus that Christ will increase in us and we will decrease. And to be used to convict Muslims to see who Jesus is. And Father, destroy all attacks of the evil one, distractions from the evil one. Keep us focused, Father, and save us from the evil one and his children. Surround us with a wall of fire from your Holy Spirit. We need you, Father. We love you. We need you and we love you, Lord Jesus. We need you. We love your Holy Spirit. Have your way. Bless this session in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. All right. No hebuhum aizen. All righty then. Whatever that means. Okay. Are we ready? Good. All right. All right. We're going to continue refuting some of the assertions that Anand Rashid made. One of the arguments he brought up, and we're going to address this specifically here, he claims that Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the prophets before him prayed, worshipped like Muslims do, so that Muslims resemble the prophets and Jesus Christ and their prayer posture because he quoted verses in which the prophets, Moses and Abraham and even Joshua and Jesus, our, our Lord, would fall down and prostrate to the ground like Muslims do. Now, I'm going to demolish that argument and show you that they did not pray like Muslims do. And Muslims do not pray like the true prophets of God and Jesus Christ do. But I want to address that in the context of his assertion that Jesus Christ worshipped a unipersonal God, specifically the Father, and didn't worship the Trinity. I already addressed that in the first part, but we're creatures of repetition, folks. We have to hear something over and over again. Until by the grace of God's spirit, it becomes second nature. He said, if Jesus was a Trinitarian, why didn't he worship the Trinity? And you saw why I got upset and even laughed at that objection. Because that's probably the silliest objection I've ever heard. How can Jesus worship the Trinity if he's part of the Trinity? Do you want Jesus to worship himself? If Jesus is the son of the Father who became flesh to fulfill the Father's will, and in becoming flesh, becoming a human being on earth, assumed the role, the status of a servant to the father, right? To become a slave to his father, then we'd expect Jesus as the perfect man to worship the father. But why would he worship himself or the Holy Spirit when Jesus does not worship himself? That would be the height of arrogance and pride, right? Nor does he worship the Spirit because he didn't come to fulfill the Spirit's will. He didn't come to become a slave of the Spirit. He came to be a slave to the Father, fulfilling the Father's will in union with the Spirit. So the Spirit was with Jesus, empowering Jesus with the very power they share in common with the Father to accomplish the Father's will. So it makes sense biblically that Jesus would worship the Father as the perfect man, not the Trinity, Unless you want Jesus to worship himself. You guys remember that objection? Yeah. Muhammad Kamaluddin, we've already addressed that in our rebuttals and sessions and articles. Your God prays, and you guys still don't know who he prays to, so don't distract us. But anyway, if you understand that, let me now turn the tables on him. Because he had the audacity to say that even in the book of Revelation... Even in the book of Revelation, angels fall down and worship like Muslims do. So you guys with me there? Guys, do me a favor. This is what the Muslims come to do. They try to distract you from focusing on the content so that you get into these side debates with them. Rebuke it in Jesus' name. Please, any, any of you admins, Alan Ruhul or Revelation, help first and last. You can't do everything and help me silence them. Right? Okay, now let's talk about the worship in the New Testament. Now you understand the answer, right? You understand why Jesus did not worship the Trinity. What a silly, pathetic objection from Adnan, but I don't expect any better from him in light of the fact that he follows Muhammad. He's a Muhammadan. But you understand how to respond to that now, right? Is that clear? Jesus doesn't worship the Trinity because he doesn't worship himself, nor does he worship the Spirit. He comes to worship the Father as a perfect man because he's the Father's servant, working in union with the Spirit to accomplish the Father's will on earth, right? So is that clear? Okay, now, let's now see whether Jesus is worshipped as God. In other words, we don't expect Jesus to worship himself. That's silly. That's pathetic. 
But do the very documents of the New Testament that Adnan appealed to show that Jesus is worshipped as God along with the Father? In other words, I don't need to show Jesus worshipping the Trinity for the Trinity to be true. What I need to demonstrate is the very writings that Adnan appealed to, the Gospels, the book of Revelation, because he mentioned Revelation, demonstrate that Jesus Christ receives the very worship that the Father does, not because he is the Father, but because he's truly divine, fully God in essence, and essentially one with the Father. One with the Father in essence and nature, right? Oh, yeah, I know, Carm. Let me make her an uh, uh, admin. Carm, help us out, sister. Here you go. You're an admin now. God bless you, right? Are you ready now to embark that journey where we're going to use the very books that have not used? And guys, I pray in Jesus' name, wake up. And the Holy Spirit anoints my words to be pleasing to yours. We're going to now unpack the breath of the New Testament witness to Jesus being worshipped as God with Jesus' express approval. Are you guys ready for that journey? Can we start with Revelation? Because he's, he mentioned Revelation. So, well, you know what? Let's start at John. Let's go to John because he quoted John, right? We're going to start with, uh, with John. You ready? Okay, does Jesus demand the very worship that the Father receives because like the Father, he is God, not a secondary God, nor is he the person of the Father, but he's the divine Son who's one with the Father in essence, nature, glory, power, and dominion. Let's go to John 5, 20 to 23. I mentioned that the other day, but we're going to repeat it again. Follow with me, guys, and I pray the Holy Spirit will bless you and our minds will be blown with what the New Testament says. John 5, 22, 23. Okay, watch here. And thank first last for posting. For the Father judgeth no, no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. For what reason? That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Did you catch it? The Father has appointed Jesus to be the judge of all flesh because the Father wants all flesh to realize that the Son determines their fate and that the Son, therefore, is worthy of the very honor that the Father receives. So the Father wants everyone to honor, and by the way, this is Jesus speaking, everyone to honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. So notice what Jesus did not say. He did not say, the Father wants you to honor me as you honor a prophet. The Father wants you to honor me as you honor your parents. The Father wants you to honor me just as you honor him. Now, the Father is God, and because he's God, we honor him by praying to him, by thanking him, by praising him, by glorifying him, by magnifying him, by asking him, invoking him for our needs, by loving him more than anything, more than our lives, more than our possessions, more than our relationships and by will be willing to die for him. Did you catch it? That's how we honor the Father. The Father is God, and the honor he receives is that kind of honor, praying to him, invoking him, asking him, thanking him, praising him, lauding him, <clears throat> loving him more than our children, more than our spouses, more than our families, more than our monies, more than our lives, and being willing to die for him. That is the love and a devotion that you can only give to God. Jesus says, that is the way you are to honor me. You are to give me that same honor. You are to love Jesus more than anything, more than your own life, and be willing to die for him. <clears throat> you are to pray to Jesus like you pray to the Father. You are to invoke Jesus and ask Jesus for your needs like you do for the Father. You are to praise Jesus and thank him and glorify him in your prayers as you do the Father. No creature can demand that kind of honor. Because that would be blasphemy and idolatry. Now, let me prove to you that's the kind of honor that Jesus receives and Jesus demands. Are you ready now for the proof from Jesus himself? You ready? Ready for the proof? I'm just going to wait. Now, there's a delay, so I wait for the response to see if you're ready for the proof. All right, let's go to the proof. John 14, 12 to 14. Ask Holy Spirit just to fool us and excite us to see how amazing Jesus is. Please, Holy Spirit, have your way. John 14, 12 to 14. 
John 14, 12 to 14. All right. Let's read. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, Jesus speaking, whoever believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Pay attention. I want to have first last post 13 and 14 again. But pay attention to what he says in 12. You're going to do the same kind of works I've been doing, if you believe in me, and a greater number of them. The same quality works, but you're going to do more of them than I've been doing. Because unlike Jesus, who limited himself to Israel, the disciples will sprout throughout the entire world, reaching more people, doing more miracles, more works. And he explains why. Because I'm going to the Father. I am going to the Father. Right? Now, what's the connection with the disciples doing more miracles than Jesus did and him going to the Father? See, when I go to the Father, that results in you doing more miracles, more works than me. Let's see. Let's look at John 14, 13 and 14 again. John 14, verses 13 and 14 again. Here's the answer. Folks, let me know if you're listening. Pay attention. Don't be distracted. And Luisa, no side talk. No distractions, please. Just focus. Please. Here's the reason. When I go to the Father, you're going to do more works than me, greater works than me. Here's why. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's the reason. When I go to the Father... Then you're going to ask in my name while I'm in heaven with the Father, and I from heaven will do the works for you. I'll be doing the works for you. I will give you the power to do the works. Jesus is claiming to be the hearer of prayer. He receives and hears and answers prayer. No, it has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, Enzo. Enzo, focus, please. He didn't say anything about the Holy Spirit. Don't add to the words of our Lord. Focus. I will do it when you ask in my name so that the Father will be glorified in the Son. So people will know that I am the Son who is one with the Father. And the Father wants everyone to glorify me because that delights his heart. So if you want to glorify the Father, acknowledge me and glorify me. Do you see it? I will be doing the works for you from heaven. He's the hearer, the object of prayer. For Jesus to be able to know who's praying to him, how many are praying to him, where they're praying to him, and then have the power to answer all those prayers, he must be omniscient, right? Omnipotent, all-powerful, and present everywhere, right? So you understand, in that very gospel, Jesus shows, like the Father, we are to pray to him. Like the Father, we are to invoke him. Like the Father, we are to ask him. And like the Father, he answers prayers. Right? Both the Hebrew Bible and the Quran testify it is God that is the hearer of prayer. Let's go to Psalm 65, verse 2. Psalm 65, verse 2. Psalm 65, verse 2. The Hebrew Bible, God's Word in the Quran, which is Adnan's book, which is not the Word of God, affirm God is the one who answers prayer. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Did you see that, Psalm 65, 2? O thou that hearest prayer, you who hear prayer, unto you all shall come. Jesus says, I'm the one who hears prayer. You get it? So you see how John 14, 12 to 14... Jesus shows that he is to be honored the way the Father is, in that, like the Father, we are to pray to him, and like the Father, he answers. Now let's see the apostles doing this very thing in the book of Acts. The apostles honor Jesus and carried out his commands because the miracles they do in the book of Acts, they do in the name of Jesus, by the power of Jesus, for the sake of Jesus, and invoke Jesus to do the miracles. Here, let me prove it to you. Let's go to Acts 9, 33, 35. Acts 9, 33, 35. Follow with me. I hope this is not boring, you guys. I hope this is educating and showing you how amazing the Bible is. 
how amazing our God is, how amazing the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit are. Okay. Acts 9, 33, 35. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, this is Peter, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. He was a paralytic. Notice 34, which you did not post. Acts 9, 30, 33 to 35. For some reason, you skipped 34 first last. Are you allergic? Acts 9, 33, 35. Start again from the beginning because you skipped 34, went to 35. Acts 9, 33, 35. Sorry, guys. Bear with us. We are humans and we are imperfect, even though I'm the closest thing to per perfection. Acts 9, 33, 35. Watch here. Yeah, I said Acts 9, 33 to 35, my brother. I know you're trying to blame me. Don't be like Eve, your ancestor. Anyway, Acts 9, 33, 35. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy, meaning he was a paralytic. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. Did you catch it? Jesus is in heaven. He's physically in heaven. And Peter on earth looks at this paralyzed person and says, Jesus makes you whole. Peter, how could Jesus make him whole when Jesus is physically not there? He's physically in heaven. Just because Jesus physically is in heaven doesn't mean he's limited to heaven because as God, he sees all creation and sustains it. He is the power that sustains creation. So you see how Peter is now invoking Jesus the way Old Testament saints invoke God? And you see how Peter says, it's Jesus who's doing this miracle from heaven? Why would a monotheistic Jew invoke someone other than God in heaven to do a miracle and that one actually then do the miracle because the one he's invoking is not someone other than God. Peter knows that Jesus is God in the flesh in heaven with the Father. You got it? Acts 16, 16 to 18. Yep, he does. Jesus is in love with us, Jason. He loves us, adores us, and in love with us. In love with us. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. Holy Spirit, rebuke all distractions. He's in love with us, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are in love with him. We love you, Jesus. We adore you. Acts 16, 16 to 18. Read with me. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with <clears throat> a spirit of divination met us which brought her masters much gain by Sue saying the same followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul being grieved turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. <clears throat> and he came out the same hour. Did you see what the apostle Paul did? I command you by the power authority of Jesus Christ, you evil spirit leave and the spirit left. Why are these monotheistic Jews invoking the name of Jesus Christ who is in heaven to do miracles, cast out demons if Jesus is in God, worthy of the same honor that the Father receives? To ask the question is to answer it, right? So do you see that Jesus is worshipped the way the Father is worshipped? Jesus is invoked the way the Father's invoked. People make their requests known to Jesus the way they make their requests known to the Father. Do you see that? Because Jesus says the Father wants everyone to give Jesus the honor that the Father receives. That means we are to pray to Jesus, invoke Jesus, ask Jesus, praise Jesus, thank Jesus, and love Jesus more than our own lives and more than anything and be willing to die for him. And these are the very documents that Adnan quoted to try to prove that Jesus is like Muslims and that Jesus is a, is a Unitarian who worships a unipersonal God. Can you believe the audacity of this gentleman? Now, where did Jesus say you must love him more than anything? Okay, let's go. Matthew 10, 37 to 39. Hallelujah, Jesus indeed. Matthew 10, 37 39. So we're going to focus on the worship given to the Lord Jesus that demonstrates he's God. 
Follow with me. Matthew 10, 37, 39. Remember, you are to love God unconditionally and perfectly and completely more than anything. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew 10, 37, 39. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. You can't love your parents more than me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life, you're trying to hold on to your life, you shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Did you catch what Jesus said? You got to love me more than your own life. You got to love me more than your children. You got to love me more than your parents. You got to love me more than anything. Because you can't love anything as much as you love me or more than me. Who does Jesus think he is? You are to love God and God alone unconditionally. But Jesus says, the Father wants you to give me that love. Honor me the way you honor the Father because I am equal to the Father in glory, honor, praise, worship, majesty. Exactly, Jason, it does. God bless you. Now let's go to Matthew 16. Let's read 24 to 26. Matthew 16, 24, 26. Yes, they are, John Mark. They are simply recycled Jehovah Witness, Arian, Anti-Trinitarian, Unitarian polemics. Matthew 16, 24, 26. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake, for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So Jesus says, you need to be willing to suffer for me, be persecuted for me, die for me, and give up your life for me. Who does Jesus think he is? And why is he demanding a love that only God is supposed to receive? Is that clear? So we pray to Jesus the way we pray to the Father. We ask Jesus the way we ask the Father. <clears throat> we invoke Jesus the way we invoke the Father. We are to love Jesus more than anything the way we love the Father more than anything because Jesus is one with the Father in essence and glory, though they're not the same person. We're going to continue. We got a lot more. I'm just beginning. Okay, now let's go to the Old Testament and do a lot of cross-referencing. Let's go. To Psalm 99, well, no, Psalm 31, verse 5. Psalm 31, verse 5. Let's start with Psalm 31, verse 5. Okay. Psalm 31, verse 5. Quirti, that's the gift of the grace of the triune God. May God perfect that ability to recall Scripture and live it out for His glory. I get better at it for the glory of Jesus, so thank Him. Okay, Psalm 31, 5, read with me. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Notice, the psalmist is entrusting his life to God. Into your hand, your hand, Jehovah, I commit my spirit. Why do we entrust our lives, our spirits, our very beings to God? Because our spirits, our life, come from God. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Watch here. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So why did the psalmist say, into your hands, Jehovah, into your hands, God, I commit my spirit? Because Ecclesiastes 12, 7 says, the very spirit that animates our bodies, makes our bodies alive, comes from God. Do you see it? So if my spirit that animates my body, that makes me a unique personality distinct from others, comes from God, then when I die, my spirit then returns to God who gave it to me, right? So it says, into your hands I commit my spirit, correct? Okay, now let's see how Jesus prayed when he was about to die. When our Lord was about to die physically, how did he pray? <clears throat> let's go to Luke 23, 46. Watch here. Watch where I'm going to go with this. Pay attention, everyone. Focus on the beauty, the majesty, the worship that our God deserves, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Orbiter High, we can see your text. Okay. 
Okay, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost, the spirit. See what Jesus did? When he's about to die, he then surrendered his spirit into the hands of the Father, entrusting his spirit to the Father, and then he gave up his spirit. Do you guys see that, right? Earlier, what did Jesus say to those who are crucifying him in ignorance? Let's read Luke 23, 34. Luke 23, 34. What did our Lord say to those who are crucifying him in ignorance, not knowing who he was, not knowing any better? Luke 23, 34. Watch here. Watch here. It's going to get more marvelous, Rob. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. So, Father, forgive these Romans who are crucifying me. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know any better. And they cast lots for his raiment. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and he gave up the spirit. Now let's go to Acts 7, 59 to 60. Acts 7, 59 to 60. Acts 7, 59 to 60. Amen, Kaffir. I pray the Holy Spirit will get us excited, fill us with such love and joy for Jesus. We start sh shouting and dancing for Christ. Acts 7, 59 to 60. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, a Jew, when he's about to die, prays to Jesus, says, Lord Jesus, my spirit is yours. And then notice 60. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Did you catch it? Stephen, a Jew, at the moment of death, cries out, Lord Jesus, I entrust my spirit to you, Lord Jesus. You're in heaven. My spirit is yours. And Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Why is Stephen praying to Jesus the way Jesus prayed to the Father when Jesus was on the cross? Why is Stephen a Jew praying to Jesus the way the Old Testament saints prayed to Jehovah? Why is Jesus, Stephen, entrusting his very life, his spirit, to Jesus in heaven? The way Jesus entrusted his spirit to the Father and the way the Old Testament saints entrusted their spirits to Jehovah. Why? And these are the books that Adnan wants to quote to prove that Muslims resemble Jesus? Exactly, Medic, because Jesus is Yehovah, Jehovah God the Son. Let's go to Psalm 99 and read 6 to 8. Psalm 99, 6 to 8. Exactly. Stephen knew Jesus is God. Psalm 99, 6 to 8. Watch here. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among them that call upon his name. They call upon the Lord Jehovah. So Moses, Aaron, Samuel are those who call upon the name of Jehovah, and Jehovah answered them. He, Jehovah, spake unto them in the cloud, cloudy pillar they kept his testimonies and the ordinance that he gave them so they kept the commands of jehovah and jehovah appeared to them in a cloud don't forget that cloud thou answerest them so jehovah answered them O lord our god jehovah our god thou wast the god that forgave us them so jehovah forgives though thou took his vengeance of their invention so did you catch it moses and aaron were priests of jehovah god moses and aaron samuel were among those who called on the name of Jehovah, and Jehovah answered them. Jehovah appeared to them in a cloud, and Jehovah gave them commands and ordinances. Do you guys catch it? Do you see all that? Samuel the prophet, Moses and Aaron the prophets, called upon Jehovah, called on the name of Jehovah, and he answered them, and Jehovah appeared to them in a cloud, gave them commands. And Moses and Aaron were priests of God. You sure you caught it? Whose name did they call on? On the name of Jehovah. Who appeared to them in a cloud? Jehovah did. <clears throat> Who gave them commands and ordinances? Jehovah. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. You got it, Medic. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Watch here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. See if you catch it. They called on the name of Jehovah. They called on Jehovah. He answered. 
Watch here. Let's read. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Did you catch it? Paul says Christians are characterized, are known for this practice. No matter where you find Christians, Christians everywhere, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you catch it? Why are Christians everywhere at the time of the writing of Paul, he wrote this around 55 AD, about 20 years after Jesus' resurrection, and why is Paul a Jew calling on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who's now in heaven, when the only one whose name you call upon who is in heaven is Jehovah? Post, post it one more time, first and last. One more time. I don't know if you guys are catching it. Hopefully you are. Focus. One more time. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Why are the Christians everywhere calling on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord who is now in heaven, when the Old Testament says, true believers call on the name of Jehovah. Hmm. Not only that, it says Jehovah answered them. And I gave you examples from Acts, and Jesus himself, he answers those who call upon him. But then it says Jehovah appeared to them in a cloudy pillar. You remember that? In a cloudy, cloudy pillar in Psalm 99? How does Jesus appear? Let's go to Acts 1, verses 9 to 11. Acts 1. Acts 1, verses 9 to 11. Jehovah appeared to them a cloudy pillar. Moses, Aaron, Samuel, among others, called on the name of Jehovah. Jehovah answered them, and Jehovah gave them commandments. Now notice what happens to our Lord Jesus. Acts 1, 9 to 11. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received them out of their sight. A cloud received them out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Jesus physically ascended from the Mount of Olives, entered a cloud, and disappeared. What is Jesus doing, leaving in a cloud? When you just read in the Old Testament, it's Jehovah who appears in a cloud. It's Jehovah whom they call upon, whose name they call upon, who answers them. And Jehovah is the one who gives them commandments. But now let's go to Matthew 28, 19. Who gives us commandments? No, because first and last has perfected the science of posting fast. You guys are not lagging. You're okay. Right? Matthew 28, 19. Jesus speaking. Watch here. Jesus speaking. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. And then 20. Notice what 20 says. Jesus is commanding them now. And notice what he says in 20 to his disciples. Watch here. Verse 20. We're going to wait. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So wait. Jesus gave his followers commandments, ordinances to follow and teach others to follow. Jesus leaves in a cloud and will appear in a cloud when he returns. Jesus is the one whose name they call upon who answers prayers. Everything that Psalm 99, 6 to 8, applied to Jehovah. Jehovah appears in a cloud. Jehovah gives commands and ordinances. It's Jehovah's name whom they call upon, and Jehovah answers. And then it said Moses and Aaron were Jehovah's priests. 
But let's go to Revelation 20, verse 6. Revelation 20, verse 6. We're going to have fun with the worship given to our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch here. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. They shall be priests of God and of Christ. So they're not just priests of God. They're also priests of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now I'm really blown away. You will not find a single verse in the Hebrew Bible where priests are priests of someone along with Jehovah. Nowhere in the Hebrew Bible will you find that priests are the priests of Jehovah and someone else. Priests of Jehovah and someone else. Priests only serve Jehovah. They're only Jehovah's priests. They only minister to him. Yet in Revelation 20, verse 6, God the Father and Jesus Christ have priests who serve both of them equally. What is going on here? What is going on here, folks? Why is Jesus receiving the same honor that the Father receives? Because Jesus said that's what the Father demands. You are to honor me the way you honor him. Why is Jesus being loved in the same way that the Father is loved? Why is Jesus being prayed to in the same way the Father is prayed to? Why do people call the name of Jesus the way they call the name of Jehovah, the way they call upon the name of the Father? Why do people entrust their lives, their souls, their spirits to Jesus when they face death the way Old Testament saints entrust their spirits to Jehovah when they die? Why does Jesus have priests serving him like Jehovah does? Why does Jesus issue commands like Jehovah does? Why does Jesus take off in a cloud and appear in a cloud like Jehovah does? What's going on here? Can you explain that to me? What's going on? And then Adnan Rashid had the audacity to use the New Testament, specifically the Gospels, particularly the words of Christ to show Muslims resemble Jesus because they pray like Jesus. And Jesus worshiped a unipersonal God. Really? Seriously? Revelation 22, 13. Are you here? Trucking with me? Actually, it's Revelation 22, 3, I believe. They're both good passages, 13 and 3. Is it clear? Before I move on, I want it to sink in. I don't know if it's sinking in for you guys. Could Jesus and his followers be any clearer that Jesus is God worthy of the same worship that the Father receives? So Jesus doesn't have to worship himself because that would be foolishness. Yes, he can worship the Father because he's not the Father. He's also the perfect man, the perfect human being, and the perfect human being worships God. But the same New Testament shows that Jesus is worshipped the same way the Father is worshipped. Okay, now let me show you something else. Let's go to Psalm 8, verses 1 to 2. Psalm 8, verses 1 to 2. Psalm 8, verses 1 to 2. Watch here. To the chief musician, guys, pay attention to the psalm, please. Everyone focus on the psalm. To the chief musician upon Gittith, a psalm of David, O Lord Jehovah, our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth and babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Let's read Psalm 8, verse 2 one more time. Let me unpack it for you. Psalm 8, verse 2. Psalm 8, verse 2. One more time, because I'm going to show you what the psalmist is saying. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou, Jehovah, you have received from the mouth of babes and sucklings, infants, who supposedly don't know any better. You receive from them strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Hold on, let's see why I'm getting text. Okay, in Jesus' name, may the blood of Jesus cover first and last, and the Holy Spirit seal first and last, 
and rebuke the attacks of the enemy. In Jesus' name, we command you to leave. In Jesus' name. All right. First, last, let me know if you're okay now. In Jesus' name, leave him alone. First, last is covered by the blood of Christ. <clears throat> okay, now, Psalm 8, verse 2. I want you to catch this. What the psalmist is saying is that Jehovah's enemies refuse to worship him, refuse to acknowledge him, refuse to praise him. So what did Jehovah do? Pay attention here. What did Jehovah do? Jehovah then moved infants and children, infants and children to praise him in order to silence his enemies and to show his enemies. Look, even these children who supposedly don't know any better, know enough to worship me, and yet you, who supposedly are smarter, oppose me. So I'm going to use children to shame you. Do you see what, what our Lord did? What our Lord is doing? Before I move on, what is Psalm 82 saying? Okay, so hold on. Did you get the point? If you got the point, I'm going to have to read Matthew 20 and 15 and 16 because our brother stepped away. May the Lord Jesus preserve him. Because I want you to see what the psalmist said. The psalmist is saying that our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, well, I meant to say Jehovah, I'm sorry. The psalmist is saying, because Jesus is Jehovah, so sorry for the for the confusion, but I am right in that Jesus is Jehovah with the Father and the Spirit. But the psalmist is saying that Jehovah God has moved children and infants to praise him, to embarrass his enemies who refuse to do so, right? So who's being praised? Exactly, Sneakers Corner. Like John the Baptist, six months old in his mother's womb, filled with the Holy Spirit, leapt at the sound of the voice of the Blessed Mother of our Lord. Excellent. But who's being praised in Psalm 8 by children? The children are praising who in Psalm 8? Jehovah, you got it. Now I'm going to have to read Matthew 21, 15 and 16. I can't post it until our brother returns. Now Matthew 21, 15 and 16. Let's see if I can. No, I don't. I can't. All right, let me read it. So follow with me unless there's someone there who can post. I don't see Protestant reformer. I don't know why he can't post. But anyway. In, Saul, in Matthew 21, 15 to 16, I'm going to read it. Notice what happens here. Follow with me, folks. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, folks, pay attention. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. So now they're crying out to Jesus. Pray we save to the son of David. Son of David, we pray that you save us. They were extremely displeased. So they're upset that the children are praising Jesus. And said to him, notice what they say to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you hear what these are saying? Do you hear what the children are saying? So they're expecting Jesus to silence the children. Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of children and infants you have perfected praise? Whoa. Jesus just quoted Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, to justify the children praising him. Did you catch it? Jesus just quoted Psalm 8, 2, to justify the children praising him in the presence of his enemies who are angry and want Jesus to silence them. Thank you, Captain and Orbiter. Do you guys catch it, catch it or no? Orbiter, do you want to post? Put a one if you do until he comes back. If you can, before I move on. Okay, Orbiter is going to post for us. Thank you, brother, until he comes back. So do you understand what Jesus just did? I don't know if it's sunk in. I don't know if you got it. Jesus said, why are you basically shocked that children praising me? Doesn't the psalmist say that's what children will do? Children will praise me? Don't you understand that even the psalmist said that children will praise me because children recognize who I am? Yeah, Karim, it's just copying and pasting. 
But hold on, Jesus. That psalm you quoted, it's not about praising a creature. It's children praising, glorifying God to silence his enemies. How then can you quote a psalm about children praising God to justify children praising you to silence your enemies unless you're God? Do you catch it or no? I don't know if you caught it. Psalm chapter 8, verses 1 to 2, basic technique. Specifically, Psalm 8, verse 2. Do you caught what Jesus did? I don't know. I mean, I'm not going anywhere until it sinks in. Jesus justifies children worshiping him by quoting a psalm where children worship Jehovah to silence his enemies. How can Psalm defend what the children are doing in praising Jesus when that Psalm is about Jehovah? Only one at a time, guys. I don't need three people to post. So we'll have Orbert to do it. Did it sink in? What does this assume? What does this tell us about Jesus' understanding of himself? To quote a psalm where children are praising Jehovah to silence his enemies who are too stupid to realize that they too should be praising Jehovah. Jesus quotes that psalm to justify the children praising him in the presence of his enemies. What does this tell us about Jesus? Who does Jesus think he is? He thinks he's Jehovah God, the very one that children worship and praise so that even children recognize who Jesus was. They recognize Jesus is God. No, not the Messiah, Sai Christian. See, again, you're too busy. Basa I was about to say, but I forget people are going to listen. The Messiah, if he's a man, cannot be praised as God. So, Sai Christian, get your head off the gutter, buddy. You're not getting it. Let me try to help Saeed Christian. That's why he should ch change his name to Daif Christian. Daif. Being the Messiah doesn't justify you being worshipped as God. So the question is, I want Daif Christian to get it. How can a psalm that has children praising Jehovah to silence his enemies be used to justify children praising Jesus to silence his enemies. Let's see if, if Daif Christian is going to get it. Okay, hold on. i got to put that on. Sorry, guys. The charger. Oops, sorry. I'm going to lose it. In Jesus' name, may the Lord protect us. Hold on, guys. Sorry. I'm about to lose. The battery's about to die. See? Attacks of the enemy, but we're covered by the blood of Jesus. And the Lord Jesus rebuked the evil one. All right. We're all getting attacked. Okay, is that clear? This took me much longer than I needed to take. That Jesus can justify the use of the psalm where children praise Jehovah to defend what the children are doing in praising him if Jesus thinks he's Jehovah God, the one that children are to praise. And even the children knew who Jesus was because they praised him. So if that if you got that point part, if you got that part, we can move on. And this is Matthew 21, 15 and 16. Matthew 21, 15 and 16. So if you got that part, we can move on to other parts showing that Jesus is worshipped the way the Father is worshipped. Jesus is worshipped the way Jehovah's worshipped. Because he is Jehovah God in the flesh, one with the Father, though not the same person as the Father. If you got it, I'll move on to other parts. And thank the Lord for Orbiter for posting. Okay, good. Other places where Jesus Christ demands to be worshipped as God. This one is a little more subtle. This one is a little more subtle. Matthew 9, 37 to 38. Alpha and Omega, it's because the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, our God is awesome and makes us awesome for his glory. So he gets the glory. Marlene, can you do me a favor, sister? Stop posting other verses not relevant to what I'm talking about and just focus on what I'm talking about. Help me, Marlene, by not helping me. I love you, sister. God bless you. Focus. All right. Matthew 9, 37, 38. Matthew 9, 37, 38. Read what Orbiter is posting. Okay, read with me. Matthew 9, 37, 38. Guys, do not post verses. Let Arbiter do it so we don't get lost in the mix-up. Again, Arbiter, God bless you. One more time. Okay. 
Watch here. Matthew 9, 37 to 38. Yeah, I'm going to have to do another part two. Watch here. You got to post them back to back, Orbiter. So we're going to wait for you again. Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Sorry about that. Sorry for the for the delay, folks. I can read it. But when someone posts it and you can see it for yourself, it helps. But I can read it. I can go to the Bible Gateway and read it for myself. You know, this is what happens. Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Okay, I'm going to read it now. Okay, read with me. Or I'm going to read it out loud, I should say. Because I don't want to delay too much. All right. Okay, guys, I'm going to read. Then Jesus said to his disciples, he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send out laborers into his harvest. So now Jesus says, the harvest is ready to be harvested. We don't have enough workers. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Ask the Lord of the harvest, the Lord who owns the harvest, to send out workers, right? Do you see that? That's Matthew 9, 38. Orbiter's taking too long, so we're going to have to can him. Sorry, you, you're fired, buddy. Okay, so who do you pray to? The Lord of the harvest, right? Pray to the Lord of the harvest, and the Lord of the harvest will send out workers in the harvest to harvest the field, correct? You guys got that part? Okay. Do you guys get that part? I got to make sure, guys, we can't be delaying too long. I'll have to then stop it here and come back later. You got it? You are to pray to the Lord of the harvest, and he'll send out workers. Now, in the very next chapter, Matthew 10, verse 1, guess who's sending workers into the harvest? Watch here. Matthew 10, verse 1. He called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease let me post it again right after telling them ask the lord of the harvest to send workers bam the very next chapter remember in the original manuscripts of the new testament there are no chapter divisions jesus sends them out into the harvest matthew 10 7 to 8 Watch here, Matthew 10, 7 to 8. As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. He called his 12 disciples, so he sends them out, 12 disciples, gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Did you catch it? Jesus then summons the 12 to himself, sends out the 12, and then gives them power to heal the sick, cleanse lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, and preach the gospel. Did you catch? I don't know if you guys caught it. Are you catching it or no? Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the field. The very next chapter, Jesus summons laborers and sends them into the harvest and gives them power to do miracles and preach the gospel. Who does Jesus think he is? Why is Jesus sending laborers into the harvest? And how can Jesus have power to give them? He gives them power. He gives them authority in his name to do miracles. Who does Jesus think he is? Who does he think he is? Who is Jesus? Then in the context of Matthew 9, 37, 38, who is Jesus? Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray to him to send laborers. Next chapter, Jesus is the one who's sending laborers into the harvest. Roscoe got it. Jesus is the very Lord of the harvest. Sneakers Corner got it. Jesus is the very Lord of the harvest who sends workers into his harvest and gives them power to harvest. You guys got it now? So Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. 
we are to pray to him the lord of the harvest to raise up laborers empower laborers enable laborers to harvest his his field See, that's why I go slow, because if you don't get it, you won't be able to stand in awe of who Jesus is and stand in awe of his word and then share it with others. Alex Haji, thank you for telling me something I didn't know, that Jesus is Lord of everything. Brah, that's not the point. In the context, he specifies Lord of the harvest. Brah. So I'm trying to make you make the connection that the Lord of the harvest, brah, is Jesus, brah? You get it now? To tell me he's the Lord of everything, thank you, Alex. I'm about to now retire, lock myself in my room till Jesus comes because I didn't know that. <laughs> Alex, why don't you get near me so I can lay hands on you, brah? I bless you, you know what I'm saying? Sucker. Okay, we got that now? So Jesus says, I'm the Lord of the harvest. You can pray to me. Jesus says, when I go to the Father, once in heaven, you can ask in my name and from heaven, I will do all the miracles through you and for you to bring glory to my Father and me. In the book of Acts, they're healing the para paralyzed, the sick, raising the dead, and casting out demons in the name of Jesus, by the power of Jesus, for the sake of Jesus. Stephen when he's about to die, says to Jesus, Lord Jesus, I entrust my spirit to you, and Lord, forgive them, praying to Jesus the same way that the Old Testament saints would pray to God and entrust their spirits to God at the moment of death. And then Jesus has priests and believers call on the name of Jesus, like the Old Testament saints called on the name of Jehovah, who had priests serving him, and Jesus rides in a cloud like Jehovah does. Could Jesus and his followers and the Bible be any clearer? Jesus is worthy of the same love, devotion, and worship that God receives because he's God in the flesh. I got more. I'm not done yet. Bless you too, Alex. I love you. Brah. What's up, man? Okay. Is it clear? Because I got more. I'm not done yet. I want to just focus on the worship of Christ and do a part part two on the worship of Jesus Christ tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? So pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. That's what Jesus says. Pray to the Lord of the harvest. Next chapter, I am the Lord of the harvest, and I'm sending you out in my power, by my authority, do miracles in my name. Wow, who is Jesus? Who does he think he is? God in the flesh. Okay, Orbiter, you ready for some more? 2 Peter 3, verse 18, if you can post it for me. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. We're going to look at some what's called doxologies. Let me explain. Before you post 2 Peter 3, 18, doxologies. Doxologies. A doxology. Let me explain what a doxology is. Doxology is the study of glory or praises, glorification. Doxas, logos, two Greek words combined. It is... The praising of God. A doxology is when you glorify God, you praise God. So you glorify him, you praise him. That's a doxology. Doxologies are to be given only to God. You cannot glorify, praise anyone other than God. So you understand what a doxology is? You guys understand that? Do you understand what a doxology is? Before I move on. Doxology is glorification. Glorifying God, praising God in prayer. Okay. Because the Bible is quite clear. God alone is worthy of a doxology, being glorified and praised in worship. Only God, right? Now let's see. If Jesus is God, then it shouldn't surprise us that we find doxologies. Prayers of praise glorifying Christ, if he's God. Okay, so let's go to 2 Peter 3, verse 18. Let's see. Uh, do you want to post, Karm? One of you guys can post. Let's see who's going to be the faster one, or I'm going to have to just read. Let's see who's the faster one of the two. 2 Peter 3, 18. 
Arbiter, you win. Okay, read with me. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Normally, after doxology, the writer will put amen. Because that's the cue for the hearers to then amen with the, with the writer. So notice, to him, Jesus Christ, be glory both now and forever. Amen. And the congregation says amen. Did you catch it? Did you see that doxology given to Jesus Christ by Peter? Post it one more time, Orbiter. Amen. See, Revelation 22, 13 did it. Amen. One more time. Watch here. Why is Peter offering a doxology to Jesus Christ and expecting others to amen that doxology if Jesus is not God? Worthy of worship. Here it goes again. Read with me. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. You caught it? Thank you, Carmen. Now let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Because we got to set this up. Watch your folks. Pay attention. I hope this is blessing you. You're not going to sleep. I'm not boring you. But this is ex it's it's putting your hearts on fire with passion, love for Jesus to see how amazing Jesus is and the Bible truly being His Word. Okay, now Second Tim Timothy four one. Read with me, folks. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice who Jesus Christ is, who shall judge the quick, the living and the dead, at His appearing and His kingdom. So notice Jesus Christ is the Lord who will judge the living and the dead. He's the one who's coming to judge when he appears in his kingdom, right? When he appears in his kingdom, right? So Jesus Christ is the Lord who will appear in his kingdom to judge the living and the dead. That's 2 Timothy 4.1. Please make sure you get it. 2 Timothy 4, let's read 6 to 8. It's verse 8, but I want to read 6 to 8. Yep, Jesus is amazing. He's infinitely amazing. Alex, you might, brah, man, what's up, Esse? All right, 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. Hit that like button, man. Let's make my YouTube channel blow up for the glory of Jesus and pray for that support to come in. The Lord financially support the ministry. I continue to do ministry till I die or until Christ comes because he's worthy. He doesn't need me. I need him. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. Read with me. Thank you, Orbiter. Please read. For I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, guys, pay attention, verse 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, remember 4, one tells us who the Lord is, Jesus Christ, the righteous judge, verse 1 told us Jesus is coming to judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Don't forget who the Lord is. Verse 1 of this chapter said, Jesus Christ is the Lord who will judge the living and the dead when he appears in his kingdom. So Paul is saying that Lord will give me a crown of righteousness because he himself is the righteous judge. And he's going to give it to me when he appears and he'll give it to everyone who loves his appearing. So is it clear that the Lord in verse 8, who gives all who love his appearing a crown of righteousness because he's the righteous judge? That's Jesus. Because now let's put 2 Timothy 4.1. You got to make these connections. If you're not making it, I'm going to lose you. The Lord, the righteous judge, who will appear and crown us with righteousness is Jesus, right? Because in 2 Timothy 4.1, Arbiter is going to post it. Let's see who that Lord is, who that righteous judge is, who's going to appear. Let's see. Read with me. <clears throat> I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the Lord, who shall judge, he's the righteous judge, the quick and the dead, at his appearing in his kingdom. So does everyone see that in 2 Timothy 4, the Lord, who is the righteous judge, who will be appearing, who crowns those who love him with the crown of righteousness, who judges the living and the dead when he appears in his kingdom, is Jesus Christ? Is there any doubt? Do you see it's Jesus Christ? I want to make sure enough of you get it before I move on to the next point. Please let me know. If you're confused, put a two. 
Because if you don't make these connections, you're not going to see the meat. Only two of you responded so far. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. Okay. Now let's look at 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18. 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18. Pay attention, 18. Watch here, folks. 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18. Watch here. Jesus Christ is the righteous judge. He is the Lord who judges the living and the dead, who appears in his kingdom. 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18, folks. Read. Watch here. Get blown away. Another doxology to Christ. Watch here. Nikau. At my first answer, no man stood with me. At my first trial, no one stood with me. But all men forsook me. Read. Okay, post it again. Too fast, folks. You guys are posted too fast for me. At my first, no man stood with me, but all men forsook. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Note 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Post it again, Orbiter. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now post it again. One means yes, I get it. Two means no, I don't. Read it again. Guys, read with me. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. God doesn't hold this against them. Now watch, 17. Notwithstanding the Lord. We just established the Lord is Jesus, right? Notwithstanding, okay, too much text again. We lost it. One more time. If you guys keep doing it, we're going to lose it. <laughs> Mighty Mouse, do not post verses for me, please. Read with me, 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. We saw in verse 1 and 8, that Lord is Jesus. The Lord Jesus stood with me, Paul, and the Lord Jesus strengthened me in my trials. That by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Notice 18, that Lord Jesus who stood with him, strengthened him, and saved him, who is the righteous judge who crowns believers with the crown of righteousness when he appears in his kingdom. Notice what he says about him in verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Jesus is our Lord who will deliver us and preserve us, because he's all-powerful. And will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Don't forget who that is. 2 Timothy 4.1. Jesus' kingdom. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Did you catch it? Not only does Paul say Jesus Christ is the righteous judge. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ will appear in his kingdom. And Jesus Christ will crown everyone who loves his appearance and loves him with a crown of righteousness. He just said that Jesus Christ is the Lord who stood by me in all my trials, who strengthened me, who saved me, and will keep me in love with him so that he'll bring me into his kingdom and to him be the glory forever and ever. He ends it with a praise glorifying Jesus Christ. Do you see it? So you guys see the point more clearly. Let's put 2 Timothy 4.1. And verse 18 back to back. Orbiter, post 2 Timothy 4 verse 1 and 18 back to back. I'm almost done. I got 11 minutes. Watch here. Watch here. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 and verse 18, back to back. Watch. When we put them back to back, you want to see what it is. Read it again. 1 and 18, not 1 to 18. That's impossible, Richard. You're not going to be able to do it. Thank you, brother. Read it. Verse 1 and 18. Read. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, so Jesus Christ is Lord, who shall judge the quick, meaning the living, and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Jesus Christ is the Lord, and it's his kingdom. Now note verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. See, verse 1 told you who that Lord is, whose kingdom it belongs to, the Lord Jesus Christ. So to that Lord be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
So Paul not only affirms that Jesus is the Lord, that he's the righteous judge who will judge everyone, the living and the dead, that he will appear and that the heavenly kingdom belongs to him. He's the king of the heavenly kingdom and that he'll crown everyone who loves him and his appearance with a crown of righteousness. He affirms that that's the Lord who is worthy to be glorified forever. Amen. And he is that Lord who is with every believer to stand with every believer in their times of trials and darkness and distress to preserve every believer to never deny Christ or fall away and preserve every believer by his power to make sure that every believer will enter his kingdom where we will enjoy and praise him forever. Do you catch it or no? Did you catch it? I don't know if it sunk in. I don't know if you guys, it sunk in for you guys. Paul just affirmed Jesus Christ is the almighty Lord, all powerful Lord. And there's no power that can stop the almighty Jesus Christ from preserving all who truly love him forever. And that he's the almighty Lord that's with all believers. He's with all of us, showing that he's omnipresent. And that he is the judge of the living and the dead. And that the heavenly kingdom is his kingdom. And he will appear in his kingdom. And he is the one worthy of eternal praise. Did you catch it or not? Let's end it with Revelation 1, 5 to 6. And I'm going to do part 2 tomorrow, God willing, on the worship given to Christ. Tomorrow, Lord willing, same time, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, if God wills. I'm going to do another session on the worship Jesus receives, proving that he's God in the flesh. Okay? Let's go to Revelation 1, 5 to 6. I'll save Revelation 5 for tomorrow, Lord willing. Revelation 22, 13, you got that? All of you? Okay. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. Let's end it. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 to 6. Read with me. Let's end it. Revelation 1, 5 to 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, he rules over all the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, unto Jesus, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, unto him who washed me of my sins by his precious blood, and hath made us, every one of us, he's made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. To him, Jesus Christ, the prince of all the kings of the earth, the ruler of all the kings of the earth, Jesus Christ, who washed us in his blood to make me a king, serving his God and Father. To Jesus be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Did you catch it? That's a doxology. That's a doxology. Karim posted it again, Revelation 1, 6. And has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Why is Jesus Christ our Lord receiving doxologies? Why did Peter, why did Paul, why did John, Jews who knew the Old Testament and knew that only Jehovah is worthy of a doxology, offer doxologies? Prayers of praise and glorification to Jesus Christ when only God is worthy of doxologies. David Doss, don't ask me a question not related to the topic. Sorry, brother. That shows you misunderstand what it means to rise from the dead. Did Lazarus rise immortal or rise to temporary life only to die again? David, answer that. When Lazarus was raised, and he wasn't the only one that Jesus raised. Was he raised immortal or raised to his temporary earthly life to die again? Let me make it quick. Real quick. Hold on. I don't want to answer, but I'm going to answer because I feel bad for David Doss, especially 
with a name like Das. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. How is that like Jesus' resurrection? When Jesus was raised immortal, he's the first one to be raised to physical immortal life, never to die again. You're comparing apples and pineapples. I hope that answered your question. All right. Was that clear? Jesus Christ receives doxologies. He is to be glorified and praised forever and ever by every creature. Jesus Christ is to be prayed to the same way we pray to Jehovah. You are to ask Jesus, invoke Jesus, praise Jesus, thank Jesus, call upon the name of Jesus, love Jesus more than life, more than your own life, more than anything. Be willing to die for Jesus. <clears throat> Obey Jesus. And Jesus is to be called upon. You call on his name. Jesus, like Jehovah, rides in a cloud. Jesus, like Jehovah, has priests serving him. And Jesus, like Jehovah, has servants entrusting their spirits into his hands at the moment of death. Because Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, our creator, our life giver, our sustainer, our judge, our savior, <clears throat> who is worthy of all praise and honor. One with the Father and the Spirit. That's why we're Trinitarians. We love you, Lord Jesus. Lord, forgive me for any mistakes I made. Please, Lord Jesus, correct any mistakes. I don't repeat them. Cover every one of us by your precious blood, Lord Jesus. Cover my daughters by your blood. Save them. Fight for them, Lord Jesus. And provide for me to do this work for your glory. And Lord Jesus, bless everyone present and fill us with your spirit to fall more in love with you and save us from the world and its influence. Save us from our flesh, our sinfulness. Save us from Satan. And help us to love you the way you deserve to be loved. And we need you, Lord Jesus. You know what my needs are, Lord. Please provide for your glory. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you. Amen. Don't forget tomorrow. Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm going to continue discussing the worship that Jesus receives, showing he's God. Don't forget, folks. I'm going on a road trip, May 12th to May 19th. A pastor and several brothers and sisters, we're going to rent a van, travel to different states, preaching the gospel, witnessing. So pray for our traveling mercies, our provisions. And if the Lord puts in your heart, remember we're in full-time ministry. Unless the Lord stirs up hearts to contribute financially, none of us can do this. So if you want to contribute, you have the information in the description box. If you want to contribute for this trip, that would be a blessing for our traveling expenses so appreciate it love you and more importantly jesus loves you he's in love with you and by the power of the Holy spirit we need to be in love with him so lord willing i'll see you tomorrow 6 p.m eastern standard time same bad time same bad channel christ is risen risen indeed take care